doing that. And uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Mike. Um, this meeting is being recorded, so we'll have a replay uh, of it uh, after it's over. And uh, Mike, uh, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Lester. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I hear uh, you so just fine, Mike. Okay, good, good. Okay, so, um, all right, we've got a bit of a late start here. Um, I'll try and, but we've got a lot of ground to cover, so uh, I will uh, try and get through this as soon as I can. Okay, so we're here to talk about um, the Informix Warehouse Accelerator and uh, give a little demo of this product. Um, my name is Mike Walker. I work for Advanced Data Tools, and I've been using Informix for about 18 years. I've uh, recently been um, working with the database support that we offer, and uh, I've got quite a bit of experience with data warehouses. Okay, so the agenda. Um, I'm going to cover what the Informix Warehouse Accelerator is. I'm going to just give a real uh, high-level overview of what it does. Uh, how do I use it? And then the benchmarks. Um, show some, uh, some timings of how much the accelerator can speed up from queries. I'm going to briefly cover how to set it up and uh, how to build a data mart using workload analysis. And uh, then uh, cover some of the new features in version 12 that help simplify the loading of, uh, of the data mark. Okay, so what is the accelerator? Is it hardware or software? Well, it, the accelerator itself is a software product, and it sits alongside your database uh, to speed up uh, your queries that are sent to your database. It can run on its own hardware and on a machine that's just uh, you know plugged into your network as long as it's connected to the database somehow. Um, or it can run on the same hardware as your current installation. Uh, the restriction, though, is that your um, hardware needs to be uh, Intel 64-bit Xeon processors. OK, so just to, to put the accelerator, IWA, um, in context here, um, this is the way most systems are right now, where you've got your Informix database, most of your, or all your data sits on disk. There's a little bit of memory that's uh, used for caching, your, your buffer pool. And every time you submit a query, it goes to look, see if it's, uh, the results can be satisfied from your buffers. If not, it goes to disk. Now, that's what we're used to. Now, the accelerator, um, as I said, it's a software product, sits alongside the database. And it doesn't really use disk. It does use some disk. For, um, for storage of, uh, of a loaded data mark, but when you submit a query, it, the disk is not in use. Instead, um, all of the um, data is stored in memory. So you normally give it quite a bit of memory to, to pull from. Um, and of course, the, the memory being much faster than disk is where we get a lot of our performance increases. So uh, the first thing you need to do is load some of your data from your database into the accelerator. And that's where it gets all squished up into memory, and lots of clever stuff happens. And I'm not going to go into that because it's, it's really clever stuff. Um, that's where all your data is compressed, uh, and it's optimized, and it uses columnar databases, and all this clever thing. Um, and so that's where your, your database, uh, part of your a subset of your database, is, uh, is now residing in memory. So now when um, you submit a query, that query goes through your database engine as normal. It always happens. And, but now the database is aware that there's an accelerator installed. So the first thing it does, hey, accelerator, can you help me out with this query? And if the, if the accelerator says, yeah, sure I can, then the results will be pulled from this, from this memory and will be passed back to the database, and then from there, the results will be provided back to your application. Now, not everything can be accelerated, uh, usually. Um, so if, if, uh, if we've got a case where the, the query comes into the database, and again, ask the accelerator, can you help? Like, no, I can't help you with this one. Then the query will be satisfied in the same way that the query is satisfied now. The accelerator will not be used, but the query will still run. You won't get any sort of failure. Now, it won't be as fast, but it'll still be um, as, you, as you're used to now. Now, 
this is a really cool thing, the fact that there's a, a failover, if you like. Um, if the accelerator can, can help, then great, it will. If it can't, then everything still gets run as normal. So this means that the entry point um, to your database is still the same. Your apps don't need to change, whether it's Java or using DB Access, or BI tools, whatever it is, they, can, they will still talk to your database as normal, but if you've got the accelerator where that can, uh, that can help out with performance, it will, and you'll see a huge performance improvement. Okay, now this differs from some other products where you've got a very separate warehouse using different technology um, and it sits separately. You use a, an ETL process to take uh, elements of your database and store them in the warehouse. But you use a separate warehouse query tool to, to get to the data that is stored separately in the warehouse. So then when, you, when you've got your applications or your BI tools, whatever, you have to decide, okay, am I querying the database or do I need to use this whole different set of tools to query the, the warehouse data? And the Informix Accelerator means that you don't need to have this separation like that. Still, if you still use DB Access or if you use DB Access now, you can continue to use DB Access. No changes there. Okay, so um, the benchmarks that we're about to show you, they're running on a very modest system here. Um, there it is. And uh, it's an IBM System X 3500 M3. And it's just got two processors in there. It can run up to 24 threads. There's 128 gig of RAM on there. Uh, we're running Linux and uh, we're running um, IDS 12. Uh, we're, th in this uh, configuration, we've got the database running on the same machine as the accelerator. Okay, so how do we use IWA for, for queries? And here I'm gonna, uh, gonna flip over to one of my windows here. So hopefully you can all see this. So here's a, this is just DB access, and I've got a very simple query here um, where I'm reading a sales fact table, and I'll come onto these tables in a little bit, but this table's got a billion records in it. Uh, this is a really straightforward query where I'm going through all of the data in order to group it all, group uh, sales by year. And uh, so it's, it's gonna be a sequential scan on this table and a huge group by. Um, and I'm going to kick that guy off. This will not use the accelerator. This is a regular query. And there we go. Got that running. And I've got the same query in this window over here. I'm just going to change a couple of things here. Just change the, the explain, uh, where the explain goes to. And I'm going to add this, this line in here that says set environment Use DWA, accelerate on. Okay, so this little statement will be submitted uh, using DB Access uh, to the database. And this statement here says, hey, accelerator, I know you're there. If you can help out, that would be great. And then this is a situation where this uh, sales fact table is in the accelerator. And you can see the other query is still running. I'm going to kick this guy off, and we'll see how long it takes. It should, shouldn't take too long. There we go, it's done. So um, in my test, this, this, um, this query takes about seven seconds. And I'll tell you now that if I was to leave uh, this other one running, it would take 14 minutes. So here's a situation where we've taken a query that would now run, regularly run in 14 minutes, over 14 minutes, and runs in just seven seconds. Um, it, tremendous improvement. Now, uh, I got the explain plans for both of these, so let, let me just take a look at, look at them so I can show you, show you the difference here. Let me see, I do a lot of testing again. So here's the regular explain plan. As we can see, the sequential scan is there trawling through all this data, it's got quite a high cost, um, and, but very straightforward, just kind of slow. Looking at the other one, though, we see this. This is telling us that the, uh, the query 
was sent to the accelerator. The accelerator could help. And we see that um, there's a remote SQL request. And it was executed, the query was executed by the accelerator, DWA in this case. And looking, looking down here, you still see the same query, but then in the query statistics, you see DWA. And, and there's our time. So it ran in just over seven and a half seconds. Pretty good. Okay. I'm going to let that run just for a little bit. Um, just to show you, it's much longer than seven seconds. Okay, back to the presentation. Uh, so here's, here's what I, I just showed you. I, we use this, uh, this little statement. And uh, you can include this uh, use DWA statement inside uh, your sysdb open store procedure. Then you don't need to change any of your application. It will just execute for every query or be there for every query each time a connection is made. Okay, here's the uh, explain plan that we just went through. Now, what if a query can't be accelerated? Well, as I explained before, it'd be processed as a regular query. Now, you can turn off that behavior if you want everything to be run through Accelerator, um, and you're expecting it to be run through the Accelerator, but perhaps um, you haven't started the Accelerator. And you don't want your, your nightly reports or whatever to just run for hours and hours. You just want them to fail, saying, hey, there's a problem with Accelerator. You can include this, this uh, another set environment statement that says, the use DWA fallback off. And that says simply, if the query cannot be accelerated, just stop. And I've got an example here of what happens. Here I, I use the query uh, similar to the last one, but I use load ID. Load ID is a column that I don't have loaded into the accelerator. So the query just says it fails and says cannot be accelerated. Uh, fall back to local execution if not required. That's how we disable it. Okay, now to the benchmarks. Uh, I'll come on to a little bit more detail in what these benchmarks are in just a second. But for now, I just want to um, uh, start these benchmarks so you can see them. I'm going to kill this guy because I don't really want to wait 14 minutes for it to finish. But um, what I will show you is where I ran these guys before. Okay, now I ran this this morning. Um, this is, uh, I've got a little, um, I've got 13 queries, and I'll, I'll explain this in a, in a minute. Um, and I, I set them up to run it one after the other. Um, and here's the results of, Here's the timings um, if we didn't use the accelerator. And the test one is the same query that we just reviewed. And it, this morning it took uh, 14 minutes. Overall, these 13 queries took a combined time of one hour and 52 minutes, so just under two hours there to run these queries. And, and they're, they're heavy hitters. Some of these are you know, pretty, uh, they're, they're going through a lot of data here and doing a lot of drawing. Uh, now, um, in this other window here, I'm going to kick off the same test I did this morning, uh, but using the accelerator. So this is my, my little test script here. And yes, I want to use the accelerator. So this is going to, going to start running. I'm going to leave this running while I, while I go through what these benchmarks are. Oh, see that first query? Under seven seconds now. Yeah. And um, we can compare this. I'll put this over here. I don't have a lot of room on the screen here, but we can leave these two, two things going side by side. Okay, uh, back to the presentation. Oh, see the second query there? Took uh, just under 21 seconds. Without the accelerator, it takes two and a half minutes. OK, um, some of you may have seen uh, the benchmarks that we did with the accelerator under 11.7. Uh, these are very similar. Uh, we've added one more query. Um, but uh, basically, the queries are the same, but we're using bigger data sets. Uh, we had problems with uh, the last test that we had to limit it. Uh, limit the data that we brought back um, because we were running out of temp space if we didn't 
use the accelerator. If we did use the accelerator, we ran out of, ran out, we hit some memory limitations. Now we've done a bit of tuning, both to the queries, to the engine, and uh, really beefed up um, the non-accelerated queries. Uh, if we had gone back to, if I hadn't made these changes, you, you'd see these queries that take just under two hours, would take closer to five or six hours. Um, I also modified the, the accelerator configuration with fewer nodes and, and gave it more CPU um, usage per node. So similar to the last set, but, but they have been revised. This is the, the schema that we're using for the accelerator. So it consists of um, a fact table. It's got a billion records in it. It represents a uh, bookstore uh, with a bunch of sales. The distribution of the data is not regular. You know, different years, different stores have different um, uh, different amount of data. Um, trying to make it more realistic, we've got customers spread all over the place. You know, stores, a time dimension, and then all of the products are, are our books. So the the total size is 181 gig. Uh, the fact table alone is 56 gig. These are the tests that we did, and I try to make sure that we use a variety of different tables. So we had, we used them all in some cases, and in other cases just the sales fact table. So we get a, quite a, a good representation of, of, um, of uh, with these queries. Now I'm going to show you this. This is the um, the timings that, that we've we've done. So you can see these benchmarks while the other while the real demo is still going on. Um, Here's a situation where running all of those queries took uh, an hour and 36 minutes. That's without the accelerator. With the accelerator, we ran all of those queries in just over 17 minutes, which is a, a huge improvement. Now, the, the amount of improvement we get varies depending on the query. So the example I showed you, the one, the one I really like would be the scan on the table. We, we decreased that time by over 99% from 14 minutes to seven seconds. And you can see in all of these, we, we saw a tremendous improvement. Um, apart from test 10, which I'll come on to in a minute, um, where the accelerator was actually slow. And that was, that was a deliberate test, just to, just to get a, um, show you an example of where things uh, are not all, don't always benefit from the accelerator. But as you can see, overall, we got an 82% performance decrease. Um, decrease? Yeah. the amount of time it took was down by 82% by using accelerator. And that really changes things. If you think of um, your nightly reports or something like that, you know, where some things you're sitting there, let's say you're sitting there for an hour and a half, and you, you're not going to wait at your desk for an hour and a half for this query to run. But 17 minutes, it changes things. Um, or just, just submitting a query through your BI tool and it takes like 15 minutes. What are you going to do for those 15 minutes? But, Seven seconds, and you're just, you're just going to wait there for, for your results to come back. It really changes the way you can do business. So um, the presentation here goes through each of the queries. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on them, just to, to kind of disclose the, um, the test that we did here. Um, so you can see that we actually try to optimize a lot of these queries here with optimizer directives, uh, so they would run as fast as we could get them running. Uh, without the accelerator. Now, what I want to show you is this query 10, which is, uh, this is the one that just takes a second if we run it without the accelerator, um, and takes uh, 27 seconds if, we, if the accelerator it, uh, is used to satisfy its query. Um, the reason this thing runs so much quicker without the accelerator is that it's indexed. We're, in this particular example, we're trying to get the, the history, the purchase history of a single customer using the customer ID. Customer ID is indexed. So we're going to find one customer record and from there do very quick joins to the other tables. Um, so it's going to be very quick. We would expect it to be quick. Um, in these kind of situations, the accelerator it doesn't make use of these kind of indexes. Um, so it does run slow. So IDS performance is better than the accelerator. 
Now this query here, this is an interesting one. It's exactly the same as the other query, except we're going in, instead of by customer ID, we're going in by last name, first name. These fields are not indexed. Now this query takes over eight minutes to run without the accelerator, but 29 seconds with the accelerator, which is comparable to the 27 seconds by customer ID. It's a couple of seconds slower, probably because it, this is a, it's a character field, but um, so you can see here, indexes will help your accelerate your non-accelerated queries, but they don't help uh, the um, stuff through the accelerator. Okay, there's uh, some screenshots of, of the test I did earlier. Um, I'm going to go back and uh, see how these guys are doing. So as you can see, we're already on uh, test eight. Um, so I uh, see test four there, which took 14 minutes, completed in two minutes with the accelerator, really just you know orders of magnitude better. Okay, so what did we, we uh, find out during this, this test, um, or these benchmarks? Uh, the fact table, it compresses in memory, it's 56 gig on disk, compresses to 19 gig in memory with the accelerator. The best performance we see when, see when we're doing uh, scans on the table or, or just fragments of the table. And uh, if, if things, things are all indexed um, and you're retrieving a very small set of data, then the accelerator probably will not give you uh, any benefit or much benefit. Um, with these tests, we didn't change them in any way uh, with using accelerator and not using accelerator, apart from that uh, set environment statement. Ran everything in DB access. And uh, so, as I said, we spent a lot of time trying to tune these queries um, so they would run as fast as possible even when they're not accelerated. And uh, so I, I played with the uh, DS total memory and uh, the number of CPU VPs quite a bit. Um, because we're using, hitting so much data with most of these queries, the, the buffers didn't really help. So, you know, I tried different settings that, you know, give 100 gig to the buffers and, and that kind of thing. Um, the benchmark timings that I've shown you uh, using these settings, um, where DS total memory is 95 gig um, for the non-accelerated queries and 22 gig, uh, just 22 gig when we use an accelerator. Um, and uh, so you can see that we're actually using fewer resources uh, of the engine here when we're using the accelerator and we're still getting this great performance. Um, so I really found quite a bit about DS total memory here. And, uh, and so I thought I'd share with you how much it really helped. Um, so we're running with PDQ priority of 100 for the non-accelerated queries. Um, so we're using all of the, the DS total memory that I assigned. So if I cut the DS total memory back to 22 gig, it's with 22 gigs, which is what I'm using for the accelerated queries, the runtime jumps to five hours. In fact, I tried it yesterday, it's closer to six. So um, it makes a huge, huge difference. I also found out how much uh, the caching, uh, the Linux caching, is helping with these queries. And we're using cook files in this on this uh, system here, so the Linux caching can actually come into play. And uh, just to give you an idea of how much it really helps, uh, for that first test, which takes over 14 minutes, even after we bounce the engine, so the cache is cleared and everything, uh, the next time we run it, it takes just over a minute. And uh, uh, that is due to the, the caching that we see on Linux. It really does help. Uh, if you weren't using cook files, and if you didn't have this much free memory on the system, um, and you weren't able to increase the, the CPUs, you would not see this kind of performance. We really, and we've gone all out of just tuning these set of queries. Okay, so there's a, um, let's cover the benchmarks. Let's talk a little bit about the accelerator itself. Um, when you're setting up the accelerator, there's a few things you've got to do, and it's really fairly straightforward. You've got to install the software. Uh, you start the accelerator, 
And then the terminology takes some getting used to, but you need to create an accelerator. Um, so yes, you've got the, the, the IWA software running, but now you need to tell the database that there's an accelerator available. That's creating an accelerator. You need to create a data mark definition. That is uh, telling the accelerator uh, what tables you want accelerated, what columns you want accelerated, um, and then you need to load that data into into the accelerator. So that's loading it into memory, uh, where it compresses it and does all that fancy stuff. Um, and then you need to configure your application to use the accelerator, and that's simply just by setting that use environment. Um, set environment, use DWA statement. Okay, so I'm just going to run through these steps very quickly. So the installation. Um, just with the, like the engine itself, uh, you've got a package to install. You're an IWA installed, you want a few questions, it's four questions. Uh, the directory, a port number, how many nodes you want running, um, and how much memory you want to get. Uh, you've got to create a, a smart blob space, and create it as, if you don't have one already, uh, you set the path to include the, uh, the accelerator commands, uh, you can optionally create a file so you can use Java with it. And then um, once you've installed it, you need to start it. And uh, so you run on DWA. On, D on DWA is the uh, command that, uh, it's a whole bunch of different options to it, but that's the main command you use now. It's like on stab and on in it, on mode. Now you've got on DWA. So the first time you run it, you run on DWA setup. Uh, and then you start the accelerator with on DWA start. Uh, the on DWA command's got a status, and here's, a, here's an example output here. Um, and you, this is a, I don't have this particular setup right now. This is something I used the previous time where I had three worker nodes and a coordinator node. I don't really have time to go into how all of this works, but essentially you've got uh, multiple processes that are running uh, that support the accelerator. Is the on DWA command. Okay, so now you've got um, the accelerator running. We need to create an accelerator. Now, um, different ways to do it. You can use a Java command. Use a, an SQL administration routine with the execute function. You can use a Smart Analytics Optimizer Studio, which is a product that's shipped with the accelerator, and it's like a GUI thing. We'll, we'll come on to that in a little bit. And now you can use OAT. Uh, with this new release, a lot of the accelerator functions have been included in OAT, which makes it a lot easier to, to monitor and administer. And here's an example of creating an accelerator with OAT. You've now got a um, new option within OAT, a warehouse accelerator option here. And you click on that, you get this screen, and um, the, the server, if there's an accelerator set up, it'd be listed right here. Um, it's not one right now, but there's an option, create accelerator. Uh, before you can create the accelerator itself, it requires a PIN number, and that's so it can set up the security or secure connection between the accelerator and your database. You run on DWA, get PIN, get this information, and you put it into OAT, a little window pops up. Okay, and then you've got an accelerator created, simple as that. Now, so this just means the, that the engine is now aware there's an accelerator. Nothing's going to be accelerated yet. Um, an entry is included in SQL host as soon as you create that accelerator, all this funky number thing in there, and that's, that's to support the encryption uh, that between the accelerator and your database. So before you can start accelerating stuff, you need to create a data model. Now, we're not talking about a data mart, you know, a, a warehouse is essentially, but we're talking about here a data mart refers to a picture of the database uh, or what you want accelerated within the accelerator. This is where you come and pick and choose what tables you want accelerated, what columns, and how, they, how those tables join. Anything that is not in this definition will not be accelerated. So even if there's just one column in your query that is not in your data mark definition, that whole query will not be accelerated. It'll still be processed as normal, but not the accelerator won't be able to help you out. Okay, so um, when you create a data mark, there's a couple of ways you can do it. 
The Smart Analytics Optimizer Studio is the GUI product I mentioned earlier. Um, it's, it's nice. It's a great way to um, draw your tables and choose your columns. Um, but there's another way is workload analysis. Um, and workload analysis, uh, which we'll come on to, um, that's now included in Oak, and that, that's really quite nice. So just to briefly hit on the uh, Smart Analytics Optimizer Studio, um, I can actually show you, uh, I've got that running somewhere, right here. So here is the, the data mark that I use for the, uh, the benchmarks. And you see it's a pretty picture here. You've got the sales fact table. The columns that, that are grayed out are not included in the, in the definition of the data mark. Um, and so you see my accelerator that I set up and the, the sales data mark. And you can just go through and choose if I wanted to modify the definitions or if I wanted to say I didn't want one of these columns in the data mark, I could just uncheck it. Um, so it, this is nice. And uh, there's options in here. We can go ahead and load the data mark, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, I'm not going to spend time on this right now. Uh, I do include it in my presentation uh, of how to, how to set it up. But uh, time is pressing, so I'm just going to move through this. Um, so here's an example where I set up a, a very simple data mark with just a couple of tables. And it really just takes a few minutes um, to actually you draw the picture of them within, within the tool. And uh, you choose the columns. And uh, this is the important bit. Once you've drawn it, you've made the pretty picture, Nothing's gonna gonna happen until you deploy it. As soon as you deploy it, now it actually becomes a data model. And uh then you can go ahead and load it. And you can load it through through the tool here. Um, but what I want to show you is oh, let's just talk about loading it. Different ways to load it. You can load it through the Optimizer Studio, you can load it through OAT, you can load it with a Java command, and you can load it with uh with another execute function, the, the administration functions. So uh, different ways to accomplish the same thing, uh, whichever works for the way you want to implement it. I, I like the Java commands. They're, they're nice and easy. Um, <clears throat> okay, but if we want to load it through Oat, uh, and again, I, I'm not going to bring up Oat right now, but I'll just show you um, the screenshots here. Uh, so here's a data mark uh, now created in Oat. Um, when I click on the schema manager, I can now choose my uh, data mark and see the tables that, that are included in that data mark. And then at the top here, I'll just cut that off, but there's a little option. When you click that, you can choose load a data mark. Just click here, and you can load it right away. And it'll load it um, at that point. You choose to lock the, lock the data mark to keep people out of it um, or not. There's also the, this nice option here where you can schedule it. So you can say, oh, you know, every Thursday at 2.25, go ahead and uh, do, a, do a load of the, the data map. Okay, uh, I do want to show you the, the workload analysis. Now, this is, this is cool. This is a, a way, a great way to create your initial data model. So um, you may be familiar with, you know, you've got a whole bunch of tables in, in your data model. And you know some of them that might be used, but you know you don't want to spend a lot of time trying to you know pick and choose the tables and the columns. You just want a starting point. So the workload analysis will look at a set of sample queries that you capture. So you might go out there and um, just just run some on stats for a while or traces, grab some uh, some of your statements that take a long time. Uh, do a quick review of them, decide if you want to accelerate them or not, or if you think that they, they, they would benefit from acceleration, and put them into a, to a single file. Uh, so you capture them, put them into a, into a query, and then you use OAT, or you can do it outside of OAT too, to, um, to create your data model. Now, um, I should stress that once you've done this workload analysis, the uh, the accelerator will not just accelerate those particular queries, 
but any combination of uh, the tables and columns that, that are now included in the accelerator. So I'm going to do a quick demo of this. Um, I've got a uh, oh, let's go back to this. So you can see here that this um, this demo that's been or this benchmark that's been running uh, for the last uh, 20 minutes or so, um, it's completed and it finished these 13 queries in 17 minutes and 45 seconds compared to one hour and 52 minutes over here with the, the those queries were not accelerated. Uh, pretty impressive, I think. Okay, so I'm going <laughs> to... All right. So, um, okay, pretty cool. Let's, let's, uh, I've got a workload analysis or a file with some sample queries here. Um, sales workload SQL. Now, these queries are the same ones that, that I use in this benchmark. So I just listed them into a single file. I did uh, set explain on, avoid execute at the top here. Because um, we don't need to actually run them. We just need to run them, submit them to the database. We don't care on the results. Okay, so what I'm going to do is bring up uh, Oat here. Uh, Right over here. So this is this is not a screenshot. This is the real thing. And uh, let's go to click on back over here. And now there's these these options here, so I can hide the, the stuff that's not the data mark. This is what I want here. The, the data marks. And you can see some some uh, other examples I've been playing with. And I. Go to data marks, create a data mark, and the screen comes up. Um, hopefully, you can see all this. I know it appears a bit small on some screens, but can't really zoom in very well. So I'm going to do this workload. Now, as soon as I hit start, um, the database is going to start monitoring for queries being submitted to the database. Okay, so now it's sitting here saying recording. I'm going to go back to my window. I'm just going to do DB access. So I'm just going to run this query. Oops. Oh, yeah, need a database. Okay, so those queries ran. No output or no rows return is what I expect because I had the set explain off. And I go over here and I see that uh, 13 queries have been captured. I hit stop. Um, and here it shows me the queries and it says they can all be accelerated, which is great. Hit next. Now, if I want to create a new data mark, so let's call this workflow data mark and choose my existing accelerator, I also have an option of do I want to go ahead and load it? Do I want to keep the trace file? No, I don't. Hit finish. And there we go. So here we didn't use the, the Optimizer Studio to create a picture and so on, but the data mark has now been created. If I go back to the house accelerator, open up the accelerator, I should see two data marks loaded. So I've got oh, two data marks that exist. I've got the sales one, which is the one I've been using for the benchmarking, and the one I just created. It's telling me it hadn't been loaded yet. So it means it can't accelerate anything just yet, but that's okay. Um, see how easy it was to create just from some sample SQL. That's what I wanted to show. It's really very, very simple. So I've, back to the presentation. There's some slides there. This is what I did. Um, here's the Java command to show me the data marks. 
I, I showed, showed you them through OAT, which is a little bit prettier, but, but here it is in an XML output. Um, and now if I want to get this into um, Optimizer Studio, I, I can do that. I unload the XML file. I go into Optimizer Studio and I can I can import it, and it will just uh, here's an example, and it'll just just draw the picture for me. So now I can then go ahead and start editing it, saying, oh, you know, that's great, but I wish I'd uh, included a transaction ID uh, as an accelerated column. I can go in and edit it. Okay, so that's that's um, uh, that's how to create a data mart and how to set up the accelerator. And you've seen the, the performance there. Just going to quickly cover the, I know we're, we've hit 1 o'clock here. Oh, sorry. Whatever time zone we are in. 1 o'clock for me. But um, uh, I did just want to want to go over the uh, new options or new new features uh, in 12 that allow you to refresh the data mart. So um, the data mart is a compressed copy of the data in your database, and it's a point in time copy. So um, whilst this is fine for data warehouses that might be refreshed every night where you refresh your data mark, and then you might want to load your accelerator, um, it means that during the day, the, the following day perhaps, when if your data changes in your database, then the results will not be reflected in queries um, and results uh, that are displayed by the accelerator. Uh, and originally, you had to reload the whole thing into the accelerator each time the source data changed. But now you can refresh just part of it. So we've got some new commands here, uh, some functions where we can refresh just just one fragment of, in this case, a, a, a fact table. Uh, so instead of loading like all our past years. We might just want to look, reload a single year, or um, or and normally that would just be like your current year, assuming that your activity in previous years doesn't change. So you can drop the data from uh, drop that one partition from the accelerator and reload just that one partition back into the accelerator. So it's just a partial refresh, and you can do that automatically with um, uh, IFX refresh mark, and that will just look for which partitions have changed and just reload those. And you can also set this up now with an oak. So in that same screen I showed you with the load, there's now where we, were, we had this load all the data set, now we can do load only the changed partition. And that will sit there and monitor the, the partitions that, that change, and uh, it will only reload the refresh those ones that, uh, that, have, that have been altered. And there's also an option now, this, this is pretty cool, with the trickle feed. So this will sit there and monitor um, the tables that are in your accelerator. And it, every, uh, periodically, and you can set the period, um, it will reload that, it will load that new data into the accelerator. Um, now, it will only include the new records, uh, not updates or deletes, um, and then uh, and that will be included in, in Accelerator. And then, so when you run another query, you'll get the up-to-date results. So here, we, we in this example, we're using our sales database with this, this Accelerator uh, name, and every 60 seconds, go ahead and refresh it. And again, this can be set up in O. Um, same sort of thing, load the data continuously and buffer for, in this case, 30 seconds. So the accelerator, it's very cool. That's a, that's why I said that. Um, the, um, you don't need to, it really minimizes what you need to do to tune your queries. Um, indexes don't matter. You don't need to update statistics, uh, for anything in the accelerator. Uh, your applications don't need to change. It just, the accelerator just sits alongside and will help out when it can and you can see the improvement that it can make. Uh, you may have seen this slide before. These are some of the clever things that, that I really skipped over. 
but uh, how the accelerator gives the tremendous improvement for the guy. Okay, I'm going to uh, hand this back to Lester to moderate any questions. Uh, but thanks, everybody. Hey, thank you, Mike. And uh, again, I'd like to apologize for the delay here in getting started and the WebEx uh, problems we had with the audio that caused us to restart the meeting. Uh, it has been recorded and uh, will be available in a couple of days on our website, uh, so please stay tuned. And uh, maybe since we're almost out of time, why don't we just go through the next couple of announcements, Mike, and then we'll come back to questions. So if you can hit the next slide, please. Got it. Uh, just wanted to say our next webcast is in two weeks, October 15th where we're going to announce the results of the fastest uh, Informix DBA contest that we've been holding. I'm actually, the contest ended yesterday. I'm busy. I've got a backlog of uh, contested entries I'm running. It'll probably be till the end of the week before I get them all run and get a winner uh, picked. But uh, it's really exciting to see what, what folks have done. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this is some information about the contest. It's also available on our website. And let's go to the next slide and the next slide. But check back uh, on the 15th. Uh, back one more, please, uh, for uh, details on the fastest DBA uh, contest. I also just want to say uh, here in North America, I think we're the only uh, place that's been doing Informix training uh, this year. We had a full course in September. Uh, it actually sold out. Um, and uh, I just want to give everybody a heads up. Uh, the next course coming up in October is an advanced course that will focus on uh, Informix performance tuning. Uh, I, I expect this to fill up too, and we'll probably close registration for that in about two weeks. So if you know anyone who's interested, please tell them to get their registration in. Um, we uh, won't cancel a course as long as one student is registered, uh, but we do have the other problem where courses fill up, and I just wanted to make a note of that because that did happen in September. And with that, we'll go to the uh, last slide here, and uh, thank you again, Mike, and thank you, everybody, for attending. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, unmute all the lines, so it may be chaotic for a minute, and just see if there are any questions. Yeah, okay. I just want to say, sorry I had to rush through that because uh, of, of the time. So if you missed anything or something wasn't clear, please be, feel free to, to give me a call or email me at this address or Lester, um, and, uh, and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. If we don't get to your questions, please email Mike or myself.